I don't like standing behind lecterns, so I'll try to talk without uh, a microphone. Is that okay for you in the back? Fine. So, um, I will tell a story that somehow connects uh, the evolution of cognition with the evolution of uh, communication, evolution of, of cooperation. And I want to see this as a kind of co-evolution of, of three di different aspects along the, uh, along the hominid line. Uh, I will spend very little time on, on the cognition and actually not so much on communication either. Uh, the focus will be on, on the role of co cooperation because I think there are special ways of cooperating that we only find in, in the human species. And these kinds of cooperation are very important when it comes to the evolution of language. That's my, that, that's my key thesis. So let's start by looking at levels of cognition. And I want to talk about two kinds. One is our ability for planning, and the other one is our ability for theory of mind. I don't want to use the term theory of mind, I'll call it intersubjectivity, but I'll get back to that later. So first of all, planning, thinking in time. I want to distinguish between two kinds of planning. One is uh, what we can call immediate planning. You, you plan for a goal you have now. You're hungry, you're thirsty, you're sleepy, uh, you, you want to look for a mate or whatever, uh, and you plan according to what, what you desire at the moment. So in the animal kingdom, we find several examples of this kind of planning. I mean, this is uh, one of the uh, fairly typical cases of a chimpanzee fishing for termites. When the chimp finds a termite hill, it goes away, breaks off a twig, peels off the leaves, and comes back, and so on. It's a very flexible behavior, and I don't want to get into the details here, but in my mind, this is a fairly typical case of, of, of planning. The, the animal has some kind of image of the tool before it embarks on, on the making the tool, and, and, and so on, and that is, is part of the planning procedure. Now, uh, the other type of planning is what is nowadays called Prospective planning. In my old book, I call it anticipatory planning, but the, the technical term nowadays is prospective planning. And that means you're planning for future goals. You may not be hungry now, but you may realize that your refrigerator is empty, and so you won't have any breakfast tomorrow unless you go shopping tonight. So even if you're tired, you don't want to go out, you realize that tomorrow you will have different needs from what you have now, and you plan accordingly. You plan for your future needs. So that's uh, uh, something that is more advanced, in my opinion, than the immediate planning. Because you have to imagine your needs. You're not experiencing your needs. You have to imagine your future needs, and you have to plan for your future needs. So that's the, the uh, prospective planning. And that gives us, the humans, a, a dilemma, because we have our current desires. I may wish to eat this candy. I might wish to smoke this cigarette, I might wish to do this bad thing, but I realize that I will regret it tomorrow, and, uh, and uh, so I have this conflict between uh, fulfilling my current desires or thinking of my long-term uh, well-being. And we solve it in different ways, we have different personalities and so on. But at least we can think about the future, think about our, our situation in the future. Um, we also know that this, this uh, capacity involves the frontal lobes quite heavily. I mean, to block your current needs, you need to have the executive functions in your frontal lobes uh, running. So that's one of the primary functions of the frontal lobe to, to, to help us in doing some form of, of prospective planning. Uh, ever since Wolfgang Köhler, it's been a dogma that humans are the only ones that can manage, manage uh, prospective planning. But then some smart people, like Joseph Kohl and his collaborators, and uh, one of my former PhD students, Matthias Oswald, they made experiments with the great apes, showing that they could save tools for future needs, that they could abstain for smaller rewards now in order to have a larger reward later, and also showing that they actually understand the function of the tools. That's not really part of the anticipatory uh, planning. But anyway, in the great apes and in some of the corvid birds, uh, it's been established that they have some capacities for, for future planning. So we are not unique as humans in, in this capacity. Uh, I still believe that we are better at it. I mean, we can plan for longer time perspectives than other animals can, but uh, it's, it's not really a, a unique 
uh, human capacity. But still, this is something that we become better at and, and I want to use that uh, in my discussion of the evolution of language. So that's planning. Uh, now, if we look at the archaeology, we find some evidence for this capacity in the uh, older one uh, tools. They are about two and a half million years old and uh, they are very crude. But the important thing about these is that it's been, it's been shown that they have been transported over large distances, tens of kilometers. And the interpretation is that the hominids have been carrying these tools along uh, with them. Animals make tools, but they carry them after, uh, over very short distances. And they only make tools when they need it for, for uh, current need. We, we still haven't seen, well, there is one counterexample to that, uh, tool making for future uh, needs. And that was discovered by Matthias Oswald in, in a zoo in Sweden. A male chimpanzee was collecting stones in order to throw at the visitors who came later in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that is, that is uh, he was uh, pre preparing himself for, and he, when he was collecting, he was very calm. And then when he, when he saw the visitors, he was agitated, he was throwing the stones. <laughs> Luckily enough, he's not very good at throw, uh, aiming, so, uh, okay. So, uh, that's not transporting, but anyway, it's preparing. Uh, but the interesting thing is that we started as hominids, transporting tools and other things. And we became uh, homo transportants. Uh, I mean, this is a picture of a Heidelbergensis, I think, or a drawing. Uh, I mean, Homo erectus is actually a misnomer. Uh, we were erect long before Homo erectus stood up uh, or was, were living. Um, so I, I, I suggest that we rename Homo erectus to Homo transportans. <laughs> anyway, so, <coughs> and I think that the, the, when Homo erectus left Africa, I mean, this couldn't have been done without carrying all kinds of things, water and, uh, and other stuff. Unfortunately, we don't see any traces of water carrying, but we only see traces of tool carrying. Yeah. No, okay, that's planning. Now let's go over to, into subjectivity. Uh, Robin Dunbar talked yesterday about theory of mind. I don't really like that term. It's a, it's a philosopher's term, and uh, in philosopher's uh, terminology, it, it involves understanding the beliefs and the knowledge of other, other individuals. I want to have a broader notion of, of intersubjectivity, including other factors, factors. So that's why I, I like the term of intersubjectivity. Sorry for the misspelling. Um, okay, here is a picture taken from a paper by Joseph Cole and some others, where they have under, compared three species, the human, the chimpanzee, and orangutan, on a number of physical tasks. And on, on, on these tasks, they are, these three species are about equally uh, successful. But if you compare them on uh, the social tasks, the even small infants beat the, um, the, uh, prim the other primates uh, quite, quite uh, st strongly. So um, uh, we are more social animals. And the explanation for that is that we have a more developed intersubjectivity. So in my old book, I divided this capacity of intersubjectivity into five components. One is empathy. That is understanding or representing the emotions of the other. And that's a fairly general uh, capacity. I'll get back to that. The second one is to understand the attention of others, to see what somebody is looking, to see that somebody is interested uh, in, in, in something. The third component is to understand the desires of somebody else, to understand that somebody doesn't like the same food as you do, for instance. Uh, uh, and the fourth one is representing the intentions of others, to, to understand that somebody has a different goal from what you have, uh, wants something, uh, something else. And the final capacity is then understanding the beliefs of others. So in the traditional philosophical literature, the focus of theory of mind has been on, on this part. But I think that if you want to look for an evolutionary explanation of the human cognition, we, we need to look more closely at, at these, at these uh, capacities as well. I have a brief uh, uh, analysis of what animals can manage these capacities and at which age children do it. And empathy is very common. I mean, we find it in all mammal species that have been investigated and in, in, in some bird species. And in, in empathy is defined as the capacity of abstaining for a reward for yourself in order 
to that somebody else f uh, feels better. I mean, you, you sacrifice yourself to some extent to help somebody else. The standard example is to put a rat in a Skinner box and, and there is a lever and when the rat presses the lever it gets a food pellet. And then after, when the rat learns that, which comes very quickly, um, you place another rat in another box and if, when the first pl uh, rat places the, presses the lever, the, the second rat gets an electric shock and, 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 and squeaks, uh, a mild electric shock. And the first rat keeps on pressing a few times. Uh, but then it realizes that it gives the other rat uh, some uh, displeasure, so um, discomfort. So it, it stops. It abstains from uh, g getting its own reward in order that the other uh, rat da doesn't suffer. Uh, and children develop this quite early. I mean, I I'm not certain about the, the timing here, but that doesn't matter very much. Representing the attention of others. Now we know that. Primates, goats, uh, dogs, uh, maybe some other uh, primates, and some birds can follow the gaze of others. And there are di different uh, levels of gaze following. Children develop this capacity in, in stages. When they are six months old, they can follow the, the gaze of the mother if she looks in the same direction as her gaze. When they are 12, they can follow the gaze of the mother when she only turns her eyes. And when they are 18 months old, they can follow the gaze of the mother when she looks at something that is behind the child. So there is, uh, there is several stages in this gaze following in children. Uh, but still, it, it comes a, a little bit later. Representing the desires of others, it hasn't been very studied, much studied in, in primates. I, I'm not aware of any, any good study of understanding what, what others like and don't like. Uh, there are a couple of studies with children. It develops around one and a half years of age. And uh, uh, the, the fourth one is representing the uh, intentions of others. And again, this is not very well studied. Um, I was only aware of one type of experiment, and that is uh, you can do this with children and with chimpanzees. You, you reach, a toy out, reach a toy out for, uh, to a child, and when the child tries to grasp the toy, you either pull it back teasingly, or you pretend that you drop it. And then you look at the child's re reaction. And with a chimp, you, 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 the chimp is in a cage, you reach out the banana, and with the, when the chimp re reaches for the banana, you either pull it back or pretend that you drop it. And uh, if you do this with children, they get more disappointed, they get more angry with you if you pull it back than if you drop it. And the chimps get really angry with you if you pull it back. <laughs> Uh, so there, there is somehow an understanding that there is a difference between an action and a deliberate uh, teasing, teasing action. Yesterday, Joseph Carl to told me that uh, Carl told me that um, he has been doing a new experiment on on, on testing the intentions uh, and the understanding of intention. And again, the chimpanzee managed this uh, 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 test. So this is an area I, th I think should be much better uh, studied. We, we don't know very much about uh, this aspect in other species. When it comes to representing the beliefs of others, the most famous cases is this case of false belief tasks. You understand that, you understand that somebody else doesn't believe the same thing as you do, and it's a well-established paradigm in, in child psychology. Uh, there are some discussions on, on the methodology and so on. But basically, somewhere between three and four years of age, children learn to understand that somebody else doesn't believe the same thing as you. This test had been, has been tried on, on, on chimps, a non-verbal version of the test. Uh, and the, again, the children learn to pass this non-verbal test when they're between three and four. Uh, chimps don't pass it. So far, no, no, no uh, non-human animal has passed the false belief task. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of methodological discussion here, but basically this seems to be unique. So the point of this exercise here is to show that there is a kind of ordering of these capacities of intersubjectivity. There is an ordering in the development in children, and there is a funneling down of the number of species that can manage it. I mean, um, empathy is, is, is a fairly common phenomenon. When we get down to understanding beliefs, it's only humans that are left. Probably only humans, I should say. I mean, you never know. Next week there is a smarter experimenter who makes an experiment, and we have to give up this uh, uh, thought as well. So anyway, uh, so I mean, I'm a bit sloppy here, but it's not so important that I get the details uh, correctly here. 
the important thing is that I have this division of the different components because this will be very important for me in my analysis of uh, cooperation. So that's uh, intersubjectivity and I have a picture that is similar to what Robin Dunbar showed yesterday that we can have these uh, higher levels of, of uh, thinking here. I can think about what you think about what I think about uh, and so on. I mean that's an even further development of the understanding the beliefs of, uh, uh, of others. Uh, and of course you can have combinations of wanting and desiring and thinking and, and feeling and so on in, in these higher, higher levels. If we look at human collaboration, we often see a kind of meeting of minds. And I want to introduce three kinds of concepts here. One is uh, joint attention. I mean, this is quite well studied in, in, in human psychology. I mean, when you're co communicating with infants, I mean, it depends very much on achieving joint attention. Both of the individuals look at the same object. I see that you look at the object, you see that I look at the object. We both look at it. That's joint attention. And that's very important in, 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 in language learning. But then we have joint intention. Tomasello and his group says that this is unique for humans to have joint intentions, to have a common goal to work on. And uh, the third level is then to have joint beliefs. To be, know, I know that you know, you know that I know, we both know the same thing. I mean, we have this, this common, common ground, as it's very often called in, 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 in linguistics or conversation analysis. I brought this picture of the boys in the preschool because they have, they have a joint intention here of building this tower of, 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 of uh, bricks here. And, and they, uh, th this may not have been linguistically formulated. I mean, it may have emerged in the, in, in, in the place. Somebody starts building and then somebody comes in and helps because it's fun to build a, a, a high tower here. But still, it's very obvious that they have this shared goal. They know, both know that they want to build a, a tower that is as high as possible. And they another thing is that is important here, that they take different roles. One is the builder and one is the supporter here. And they, th this may be an emerging thing. I mean, not, there may be no linguistic uh, agreement on this. It's just something that emerges in, in the game. But I, ha I don't know of any animal thing where you have this kind of situation. Animals taking different roles and for, a, for, for, for a common for common goal. That, I mean, then that is a flexible thing. Of course, you have uh, biologically determined situations like in anthills and so on, but then it's all, all instinctual. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is a fairly uh, natural situation for humans, but it depends on joint intention. Now, of course, I mean, joint attention here, both, both of them are looking at the same thing and it's joint attention. This situation doesn't depend on any joint beliefs. I mean, there is no sharing of knowledge here. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't have to be. Uh, yeah. So we depend very much on joint attention and joint intention for, for our cooperation. And I will get back to that in, in, in a while. OK, that's the levels of cognition. Let me say a few words about levels of uh, communication now, uh, just uh, as an introduction. And the only thing I basically want to say is the di distinction between signaling and, and symbols. So we have animal communication, and there is a lot of animal, different kinds of animal communication. Uh, I mean, vervets, alarm calls, bees dancing, uh, warning cries, food calls, uh, mating calls, lots of kinds of um, uh, communication. But what is common about animal communication is that it's all, all, always about here and now. There is food now, there is a danger now, there is a mate here and now, my, 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 my child is gone now, and, and, and so on. Uh, so it's, it's always about here and now. So that's why I call it signaling. Symbols. They, I characterize the notion of symbols. I mean, this is a, an eternal philosophical problem to describe what a symbol is. But for me, the, the important thing is that they can refer to things that are not present. So for me, this is the important distinction in, in, in the emergence of language, that the, we get a system that has something that can refer to, to um, uh, things that are not present. It doesn't have to be sound v words or anything like that. We can do it with gestures. We can do it in all kinds of modalities. But this is some kind of symbolic system that refers to non-present things. So the modality is, for me, not, not the important char characteristics. Here. Sign languages, miming, may, may do the thing. And 
this is a very crucial point. If we want to cooperate about the future goal, we need symbols. So if the goal is present, I mean, we, if we are in, into uh, hunting, for, for instance, I mean, we, uh, we, we have to focus on the same individual, and it's sufficient that we have joint intention to the, to the referent in order to coordinate our, uh, our, our, our actions. So then we don't need any, anything. We, maybe we, we can do some pointing or, or, or whatever, but it doesn't matter. We don't need any symbols. However, if we want to do something tomorrow, we want to build a, a shelter or a plan a, a hunting and so on. There is nothing to point to. There is nothing to look at. And, and then we need, then we need some, some, some other form of communication. Uh, Robin Dunbar introduced the sitting around the fire in the evening. I mean, uh, there, there isn't, I mean, you can talk about a lot of things, but you don't want to talk about the fire all the time. I mean, you, uh, you want to have some other kind of communication, communicate about other people uh, and communicate about the events today and, and the events tomorrow. Then you need symbols. I mean, you can maybe do it by, 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 by gestures, but you need some form of symbolic system. And I'll get back to that. So, um, uh, yeah, so this is, this is uh, a point I've already said. I mean, you need something, some other. So that's all I need to s want to say about communication at the moment. Now let's get to the, the central part of my talk, the levels of cooperation. And what I want to do here is to introduce a kind of finer grading of different forms of cooperation. Uh, I mean, if you look at game theory, a game is either cooperative or non-cooperative. There is no, no grading. I think that's a big mistake because there are different kinds of cooperation. If you want to look at evolution of cooperation, you nearly, really need to do that. So what is cooperation? Okay, basic definition. That is something that is mutually uh, beneficial. I want to have a slightly more narrow definition where a joint action poses a dilemma. Uh, I mean, like the, the, the typical case is the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, if you work together, you, you both get better off, but there might be a temptation to defect. And uh, so that's the, uh, that's the kind of uh, situation I want to have. You, you have to decide whether you need, want to cooperate or not to cooperate. I mean, that, that's the kind of situation I'm, uh, I, I'm looking at. Uh, but let's, get, let's do, let's do um, uh, some examples instead. So, a very basic form of cooperation is flocking behavior. And you find that in a lot of species. I mean, schools of fish, flocks of birds, herds of antelopes, so on. Lots of species flock together. And the basic evolutionary function is to pr avoid predation. I mean, if you're alone, you run much uh, greater risk of, of being eaten. So being in a flock helps saving you. And that doesn't need very much of cognition. I mean, in birds flocking or in fish uh, swimming, in, swimming in schools, um, very simple rules. I mean, the rule is try to be as close as possible to the center of, of the flock, and, and, but keep some uh, minimal distance to your neighbor. That's basically the, the rule for be, uh, creating a flock. And there's, there are lots of uh, computer simulations of that. I mean, as you notice, there is very little cognition involved in that. You just have to have perception in order to, 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 to create a, a flock. You don't have to recognize the other individuals. You don't have to think very much ahead of time and so on. And then what decides the movements of the flock is another story. But basically, I mean, this is a very simple form of cooperation. And it's, from an evolutionary point, it makes a lot of sense. Let's take a slightly more advanced form. In-group versus out-group uh, cooperation. This is also very common in, in, in many species. You have some kind of in-group. Your beehive, your ant hill, or your, uh, or your family of baboons, or, or, or whatever, your troop of baboons. Um, and you behave differently. To the members of the flock, you are more cooperative. To outsiders, you're aggressive. I mean, you, you're sometimes aggressive to your members of your flock as well. But there, I mean, there is this difference. Take bees, for instance, in, in, in example. They cooperate without thinking about it. But if you take one bee from one hive and put it in another hive, that bee will be attacked immediately because it smells differently. And, and if you take that back again to the first hive, it will be attacked because now it smells, smells of, the wrong, uh, of the wrong hive. Uh, 
so very often this in-group versus out-group is de determined by our olfaction. So if somebody smells nice, you, you so cooperate. If they don't smell nice, you, you're, you're aggressive. Uh, I mean, again, I introduced this just to say that uh, this behavior doesn't need very much of cognition either. Uh, but you, you, you decide. And again, there are evolutionary mechanisms explaining why this behavior, this form of co cooperation, makes, uh, makes sense. But still, very little cognition, very little communication is involved. I mean, it's, I don't want to call all faction communication, but uh, okay, some people do. Um, this is a more interesting case, reciprocal altruism. In, in the brief form, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Here is a nice picture of two chimpanzees scratching each other's armpit. Um, it's not really a good example of reciprocal altruism because normally you take turns and here it's simultaneous. I mean, first I give you a favor, then you do me a favor and so on. Uh, this we find in a few species, mammal species mainly, I think have been studied here. And, and the reason is that this is cognitively much more demanding. Yeah? So you can model it in game theoretic terms as iterated prisoner's dilemma. You have a choice of cooperating, that is, grooming somebody else or not grooming, defecting. And then you're hoping that if I groom you, you groom me the next time we meet and, and, uh, and so on. And well, of course, the other one can defect uh, again. So it's, it's an iterated prisoner's dilemma. And what makes it uh, is that there is a possibility to retaliate. If I groom you, but you don't groom me, I will hit you. I mean, that's, um, uh, that's a reality. And, but anyway, the, this, if the system works, it builds up a dyadic trust between two individuals. They somehow learn that they can trust each other. I, I know that if I help you, you will help me in the um, uh, in next time. And there are even neurophysiological correlates of this uh, trust mechanism. Now, we can look here. We need a much more cognitive uh, uh, capacities to have this mechanism running. First of all, you're, you have to think about the future rewards. You have to think about the expectation. So in, 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 in technical terms, the temporal, temporal discounting of future rewards is not too steep. And there have been studies. I mean, some animals uh, don't value future rewards very much, like pigeons. Uh, rats value, value it more. And humans have a fairly slow uh, discounting of, of the future re re rewards. And it turns out the primates in general have a fairly slow uh, uh, discounting of, of, of of, of future uh, rewards. So that's one factor. And you have to keep track of the interactions with, with several individuals. Uh, I mean, you have to remember that this guy was nice to me, but this one was bad to me last time and so on. You have to keep track of, of the in, in interactions. Uh, I should also mention that you have to, of course, recognize individuals. I mean, bees don't recognize each other, but primates do as, as individuals. And you can't build up an, any reciprocal altruism without uh, recognizing individuals. Uh, so, so that's a, a cap capacity. Communicative demands. Still none. We don't need any communicate. It's just actions and, and counteractions that, that are needed. But uh, I hope you see that now we need a little bit more of, of at least memory here to have this system, uh, uh, system running. And you have to have a fairly uh, established social, uh, social system. Some people make distinctions between different forms of reciprocal altruism. I don't want to get into the details here, but you can make finer distinctions in this, this form of cooperation. So this is a more advanced form. Now let me get into two forms of cooperation that I think are uh, uniquely human. I mean, again, we're up for, the, up for surprises. But so far, as I said, cooperation about future goals, I still think is, is, is uniquely human. Uh, we, we know that. Some animals can plan for, for, for future goals, like this chimpanzee throwing stones. Uh, but so far we haven't seen any animals planning for future goals. And then people say, well, cooperative hunting then. I mean, uh, isn't that the planning for... No, it's not, because most of the instances, or all instances I'm aware of, involve there is a prey present on the scene, and they coordinate actions. I mean, it's cooperation, but it's not cooperation for a future goal. There is never a planning of, of, of a hunting uh, in, in other species. So I think this is u uniquely human. And I hope you see immediately that this, this builds on the capacity for, for uh, prospective planning. Yeah? 
I mean, you have individual perspective planning, more advanced if you can have individuals coordinate their perspective planning. And that means, well, I'll get back to that, that means sharing intentions. So co cooperating, cooperating for future goals is sharing intention. And th as I showed earlier, that's, uh, that's a fairly advanced thing. I mean, we saw it in these kids in the, in the preschool, but uh, I don't think we see it in other animals. And the second one is what is called indirect reciprocity. We can illustrate it with the Good Samaritan. I'm helping somebody else without expecting help, uh, being helped back. This is a person I, 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 I meet by accident, and I will probably never meet him again. But I'm still sometimes. I, I'm helpful. I mean, not always. And we are very different as uh, individuals here. I mean, if, if you're driving a car and there's a hitchhiker, maybe sometimes you pick up the hitchhiker. If there has been a car accident, maybe you help somebody. Sometimes you don't. But, I mean, we have, we have this capacity, or limited capacity, of helping others without expecting anything in, in return. So from an evolutionary point of view, this is a riddle. Because this seems that you're, you're losing in your own in your own fitness by helping somebody else. You don't get anything back. So how can this, how can this uh, be given an evolutionary explanation? Well, there are some recent models of, of this. And the one I like quite a lot is a model by Novak and Sigmund, was published some years ago. So the difference is, here is, here is a, 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 um, reciprocal altruism. A helps B and B helps A. Now, in, in indirect reciprocity, first helps B, A helps B, then B helps C. But the A may never meet C, and uh, they may never, never meet again, these partners. Or C helps, uh, first A helps B, and then C helps A. I mean, it's, it's a kind of, involves several more people, and m not any re repeated interactions. So that, this is the kind of game situation you have to understand. So they model this, uh, yeah, and I should say that. This kind of indirect reciprocity becomes more relevant as community size increases. I added this line after listening to Robin Dunbar yesterday, that when, when, the, when you get this multi-layered system of human interactions, uh, you need, I mean, in, in a small group, you can do, de depend on in-group, out-group behavior, or you can depend on reciprocal altruism. While if you want to interact with larger groups, you need some other mechanism. So the indirect reciprocity becomes more relevant in, 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 the, in that situation. Uh, and in their modeling, they assume that any two players only interact w uh, once. So there can be no trust built up, nothing like that. And, uh, so how does it work? Well, their, their proposal is that, uh, okay, the problem is in, in this modeling is that the victim of a defection cannot retaliate. Uh, if somebody, uh, I mean, if I, if I help B, then I'm, I, I think I'm a nice guy. And, and I, I hope that somebody else will help me when I get a flat tire in, in, in my car. And if nobody helps me, there is nobody I, I can retaliate on because the guy I helped is gone since long and there is nobody I can... I can. So there, there's no way for me to gain, get any benefits back. Um, so how can we solve this? Well, their solution, Novax and Sigmund solution, is to introduce the notion of a reputation. Each individual has a reputation that is somehow known in, in, in the group. And the reputation is built up. I mean, there are these interactions, helping or not helping. And these interactions are observed by some, some individuals. And then the knowledge about this interaction is spread in the group. And here they write the word gossip. Uh, I mean, they, they, they think of gossip as a mechanism of spreading the reputation of individuals. And so the idea of this model is that by being a nice guy, by helping, being a good Samaritan, your reputation as a good person goes up. And if you have a good reputation, other people will be more willing to cooperate with you. So you will benefit because you have a good reputation. And, and if you have a bad reputation, people will not cooperate with you. I mean, if you don't help other who, others who are in need, your reputation will go down and, and, um, and others will, will not help you. And using this mechanism of reputation, Novak and Sigmund were able to show by computer simulations that this behavior of indirect reciprocity could be established as an evolutionarily stable strategy in, in this kind of, 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 of gaming situation. 
and that populations involved in, in indirect reciprocity were, were gaining in, 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 in fitness. So this mechanism of indirect reciprocity can be given an evolutionary backing, but it depends on this mechanism of reputation. Now what they didn't do, Novak and Simon, is to ask what is needed for this mechanism to work. They left it here. So I went a step further and tried to understand what is needed for a gossip to work, for this reputation mechanism to work. So, Let's see, cognitive demands. You have to recognize individuals, that is to see, I mean, remember that this is a good guy or this is a bad guy, I mean, that's, that's important. You have to remember and, and also be able to update their reputation scores. An individual doesn't come with, only with a face, it, it also comes with a reputation, and you have to have this memory. And of course, this puts requirements on memory uh, to, to keep track of all this, uh, but it's not impossible. Uh, and you have some form of into subjectivity. You have to understand whether an action, if somebody does, if A doesn't help B, is that because A, a is a bad guy or because A knows that B is a bad guy, so A doesn't want to help B. So you have to understand what is going on in this situation here in order to judge whether A, a is doing something good or, or, or bad. Uh, now, we get to the more, most interesting part, I think, here, the communicative demands of this. And since you have to refer to the interactions between individuals in their absence, you need some mechanism of referring to the individuals. You can do it with the descriptions, but we use, very often use names for, for doing this. Uh, I, mean, we can be, that, I mean, some kind of definite descriptions is needed to identify an individual in his or her absence. There is no, lang there is no animal communication that has this feature of identifying uh, individuals. Uh, dolphins have identifying signals, I mean, they identify themselves, uh, but that's a different story. But here is the, here is the m even more important thing. You need so some form of communication device involving symbols that say that X was good to Y or Y was bad to X. And the important thing about this is that you have to know the role here. Know who is the ag agent and who is the patient. So this mechanism involves a very minimal syntactic division between agent and patient. Otherwise, otherwise the uh, reputation mechanism uh, doesn't work. So I see this as, as a possible root of syntax. Uh, the reputation, uh, for reputation to spread, you need this role marking of agent and patient. Uh, it's not very much of a syntax, but still, it's, it, 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 it's some form. Uh, and of course, you, you may need a, a little bit more. I mean, to have a good reputation mechanism, you, you need much more. But I mean, I'm trying to pick, pick out the, the minimal requirements of a communication system that manages a, a reputation mechanism. And there is this role marking that I, I, I think is, is, uh, is necessary here. So, uh, this analysis leads me to two hypotheses concerning the evolution of language. The first thing is that when it comes to cooperation about future goals, proto-language uh, may be sufficient. And by proto-language, I now mean, looking at Professor Krzysztofsky here, I, I now mean uh, Bickerton's notion of, uh, of uh, 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 language, that is, a, a vocabulary, but without any syntax. So we, we can use the proto-language to, to describe our plans. I mean, maybe not be, syntax is ba better, of course, but I can, I can tell you a little bit about my plans using body language or using uh, proto-language, and you, you can respond. Uh, we don't need, we, we, can, we can form joint intentions using proto-language. That's, that's, that's my point. So, proto-language may be sufficient to get a cooperation about future goals running. And then, of course, I mean, th this is a co-evolution, and, and things will we'll add more things uh, uh, over time. Uh, and then, if you want to have a indirect reciprocity, you need some minimal form of syntax. Uh, so, uh, uh, we need a, a little bit more the, uh, properties of language in order to have this, uh, this form of, form of uh, cooperation going. Uh, so, two fairly bold theses, uh, not very well uh, specified in detail, but still a connection between the two levels of language and two forms of uniquely human cooperation. And indirectly, you then get a, a, a well, let, let me do that on the next page. Here is an ugly, ugly table. Uh, I have now, 
I've talked about flocking behavior, in-group behavior. Here are two different kinds of re reciprocal altruism. I don't want to get into the details. I talked about cooperation on future goals uh, and indirect reciprocity. We have even more advanced forms of, of human cooperation. We have commitment and contract. I mean, contract is a, is, is a more advanced form. And we have conventions. And then we have homo economicus, and I don't want to talk about him today. But anyway. Uh, and then I've tried to make a list here. I mean, this is a very first approximation, but uh, I mean, you, you, I've talked you through most of these uh, uh, details here. Um, uh, I didn't talk about episodic memory that we have to re remember. I mean, the episodes. I, uh, there is this different, different distinction between semantic and, and episodic memory. In most of the earlier forms of cooperation, you, it's sufficient to have semantic memory. Uh, 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 reputation, uh, gossip uh, requires uh, episodic memory. Episodic memory seems to be unique, unique in, 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 in humans, or at least better developed than humans. Uh, yeah, uh, and, and for commitment and contract or for cooperation, we need joint beliefs, which uh, is uh, higher up on the, on the list. And most of, most of the uh, uh, forms of cooperation don't need very much of communication. Here we need proto-language, here I need a syntax for roles, uh, and uh, yeah, Co conventions don't really need uh, uh, symbolic communication. How am I doing on time? Uh, it's okay. Um, so, I don't want to you to take this list too seriously. This is my first approximation. I mean, first approximation of having a, 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 a classification of different forms of, of cooperation. You can get into the details here. You can pr formulate it much more precisely. And then having a kind of analysis of what is required cognitively and what is required communicatively in order to uh, maintain these forms of, of, of cooperation. Um, so this is more a research program and, than any, any fixed results. But I want to emphasize, I mean, this red line is somehow my current dividing line between uh, non-humans and, and human forms of, of, of cooperation. And as you see, there are lots of cases where we, we need, where we need uh, 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 intersubjectivity and fairly advanced joint attentions, uh, joint beliefs, and, 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 and so on. So the higher forms of cooperation, higher in the list in, in this sense, in the lower in the list here, uh, are, are require higher forms of, of um, intersubjectivity. So, I mean, this is, this is my research program, and I want to add this in order, it's a kind of implicit criticism of the game theoretic analysis of, of, um, of uh, cooperation that you find in the economic uh, literature, which I, I think is too simplified because they only make the distinction between cooperative and non-cooperative games, and I, I, I don't think that's sufficient. You need to get into more details here. So, uh, let's connect a little bit to the economic tradition here. Fehr and Feshbach, who, who have, uh, and Fehr is one of the guys who, who do work in this era, and he says that the human capacity to establish and enforce social norms is the decisive reason for the uniqueness of human cooperation. Yeah, it depends, of course, on what you mean, what you mean by the decisive reason. I want to go uh, uh, one step deeper and say that the, it's, it's the advanced form of intersubjectivity that is the fundamental form of uh, human cooperation. I mean, unless you have this intersubjectivity, you cannot enforce the, uh, establish and enforce the so social norms. I mean, these social norms are dependent on joint intentions and joint beliefs. Uh, otherwise, you don't get the social norms. Uh, so, uh, again, we need the, the intersubjectivity. Uh, okay, that's exactly what I said just now. Uh, okay. <sighs> I haven't presented a very much of data here, and I, I don't have any data, but I have a, a classification of different forms of, uh, of, of uh, cooperation and the connections to communication and, and, and cognition. So the question is, what kind of data would we like to have to, to confirm this uh, thesis? <laughs> and and uh, so let me say something about cooperation about future goals. And one thing I didn't talk very much about is the, the, the division of labor. I mean, in all human societies we find division of labor. Some is a specialist on that, some is a specialist on that. Some people go hunting, some people collect food, some people collect firewood to, uh, to, make, the, uh, to make the fire at the evening. I mean, if you go hunting, you don't collect firewood and so on. So the point is that in order to have this system, you have to have some kind of 
you don't have to have it, but it will be enhanced by, by communication about future goals. I mean, you may establish, uh, establish division of labor just as a convention without any linguistic, uh, linguistic um, uh, agreement. Co the, the, this can arise without language. I mean, I'm pretty sure about that. But of course, it's improved if you can communicate. Uh, today, I'm tired. You go hunting. I go uh, collecting the water or whatever. I mean, uh, and, and so you can, you can have a flexible system of the division of labor if you have, if you have language. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why there's a question mark. It's not really necessary here. And s similarly, since I heard Robin Dunbar talk about the use of fire, I mean, for me, this is a special case of division of labor. I mean, if you go hunting, you don't go collecting your food. I mean, this, I think that th this is a sign of, of having a society where you have a division of, of labor. But still, that might emerge. Big game hunting, that s some forms of big game hunting requires planning. I mean, you have to prepare. You have to set up an ambush or, 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 or dig something or, uh, uh, to, to be able to, 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 to catch the big game. That, in most cases, requires uh, collaboration for future goals. I mean, this is not nothing you do on the, on the, on the spot, or at least it will be much improved by, by future collaboration. And signs of large, dwell, large dwellings. I mean, you, if you build some kind of protection thing together, I mean, it's not something that can't be done by one individual. That also needs a planning for future goals. So, when do we find this? Well, Robin yesterday said that fire was established, clearly established by 400,000 years ago, and then things. Uh, Robin Nambra said that things happened very quickly after that. There, are, there is. Not very much evidence of big game hunting, but there is a fine Neanderthal find in Schöningen in Germany. Uh, a lot of horses collected together with a, no, a lot of spears. And that's been interpreted as a, a collective hunting of these uh, wild horses. And these spears are 400,000 years old. And then uh, there is the, the oldest example I know of is Terra Amata in southern France. Uh, it's contested whether it really is a large dwelling, but if it is, I mean, the age is, is about 400,000 years. I don't know if this is a coincidence, but I mean, it's, we suddenly have three, three cases of, of 400,000 years ago here. And so uh, my, my conclusion here is that proto-languages most likely existed at least 400,000 years ago. Uh, and and uh, I mean, it, for me, it's sufficient that one example here is established, and one clear example of collaboration for future goal uh, is established in the archaeological record. Uh, is sufficient to to show that they had some form of proto language. It need not be spoken language. It could be it could be gesture gesture based language, but at least it was a symbolic language where you could were able to uh, refer to something that is not present. So. The point here is that we have a proto-language before we have Homo sapiens. I mean, that's the, uh, that's the conclusion I, I, I want to draw here. Then we get to um, indirect reciprocity. Here I don't know. I mean, I, it's very difficult to, to find any, any, uh, any uh, material evidence of w that, that you have, that you have uh, a system of gossip. Uh, maybe if you, I mean, you have some, some uh, signs of social hierarchies or roles and so on. I mean, if you have a good reputation, you, you get a certain, certain uh, status marks or whatever. I mean, that could be an indirect evidence. But I mean, I put the big question mark at the end here. I mean, I'm not sure this even. So here, I don't really know what would be good evidence for, for showing that, uh, that we have a system of indirect reciprocity. Uh, as I say, cognitively, this is more, uh, more advanced than the uh, cooperation about future goals. So probably it comes later in the evolution, uh, but I'm, I'm not perfectly certain here. But at th this point I, I really want to emphasize, and here, here I stick out my neck a little bit in, in making this prediction that we had proto-language before, uh, before the uh, Homo sapiens. So I made my triangulation. I mean, th th these come in levels. I mean, levels of intersubjectivity, levels of planning, levels of cooperation. I've given you my list of levels of of uh, cooperation, and I haven't talked very much about levels of communication, but at least signaling, proto-language, and, and uh, symbolic language, or say language with a syntax, I'm sorry. Uh, so they, there is a, um, there is a, um, uh, a, 
uh, co-evolutionary. I didn't talk very much about the ecology of early humans. I forgot that. And the important thing here is that the difference, I mean, we have common ancestors with the chimpanzees. The difference in, in ecology is that <coughs> chimps live mainly in forests, not exclusively, but mainly in forests, live much more on fruit than, than the proto-humans. Uh, the proto-humans, uh, the, proto uh, the hominids, uh, uh, got adopted to this uh, open life and open landscape. And that made their, their traveling ranges much larger. They were much more dependent on, on larger distances. And that larger distances created an evolutionary pressure for planning before you did something. So the open landscape created some kind of evolutionary planning, uh, pressure for the development of the, of the prospective uh, planning. That's my, my connection here to the ecology. Uh, yeah. So, I've said the rest. Thank you very much. <clears throat> <clears throat>